John Albertston is a church growth expert who works with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. He grew a church from 300 to 1,500 people in a span of only five years. The last year he was there, he saw over 700 salvations. Then he was asked to help the 120 churches in his district to grow. Today, he shares some simple secrets that are guaranteed to lead to church growth. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Welcome to the Evangelism Podcast with Dr. Daniel King, where Daniel interviews full-time evangelists, pastors, missionaries, and normal everyday Christians to discover how they share their faith, their powerful testimonies, and amazing stories that will inspire you to reach people with the good news. And now, here's your host, missionary and evangelist, Daniel King. Welcome to the Evangelism Podcast. I'm Daniel King. I'm excited about telling people about Jesus. Today I have a special guest with me, John Albertson. And you are with the Pentecostal Assemblies here in Canada. And you are a church coach. And so I love coaching. I especially love coaching evangelists. But you're going into churches, helping churches to grow, helping them to think strategically about how to reach their community. So how did you get started doing that? Well, my story was um, my last church, uh, our church grew from 300 to 1,500 people in the span of five years. And the last we were there, we saw over 700 salvations. Um, that's when I got a phone call from the Pentecostal Assemblies just saying, John, would you like to show other churches how to do that? And I was like, yes, I would love to show other churches how to do that. Uh, and that's when we got started. I uh, got started doing that in 2017. And when we started here in our district, we've got about 120 churches. Uh, we ran the numbers and we found that only 18% of our churches were growing. 82% of our churches were either plateaued or in decline. Um, we're happy to say that within a couple of years, by 2019, we had doubled the number of growing churches and doubled the number of annual reported salvations. So we, our churches weren't growing because we were trying to convince Baptists to come to our church instead, but no, we were genuinely reaching unchurched people in our community. Um, now COVID hit, that threw our numbers right out the window. Um, but now that we're coming out of COVID and sort of re-getting our, our bearings, it's looking like we've got pretty close to 50% of our churches growing and by the end of the year, we think we might be able to get 60% of our churches are growing, accomplishing real Great Commission salvation growth. And so what are some of the things that you are helping churches with when you are encouraging them to reach out to their community? Well, one of the first things is just to understand um, their own purpose as a church and what they need to do in order to grow by reaching lost people. Because if you want your church to grow, what you need to do is you need to reach people in your community, bring them in, introduce them to Jesus, and then have them stay and learn how to follow him. Now, when I have conversations with pastors, like, are you doing that? Are you reaching people, introducing them to Jesus, and then teaching them to follow him? The answer is, oddly enough, no. You know, we've been trained in Bible school and seminary how to run services. You know, I was trained on how to be an exegetical preacher. Um, I wasn't taught how to speak to non-Christians. I wasn't taught how to disciple non-Christians. You know, when, when someone accepts Jesus as Savior, what's the first five things I'm supposed to teach them? I don't know, that, that was never a class. So organizing our church so we're actually accomplishing our mission is just something that most of us as pastors were never trained to do. And before we were too eager to blame our professors, nobody trained those guys how to do that either. Um, so if we want our churches to grow, that's what we need to focus on doing. I think one of the challenges is that everyone who pastors a church has been around churches for a very long time. And so they don't look through the eyes of a visitor or a first time guest or someone who is seeking spiritual enlightenment, who just wanders into the church. What would you tell a church to help them to make that person feel welcome? 
Well, I'll tell them a few things. One, just the importance of it. Um, as a general rule of thumb, on any given Sunday, 96% of the people in the room are your own people. And it's so easy and so comfortable just to focus on that 96%. Only 4% of the people in the room are first time visitors. So if I focus on my 96%, I, I know their vocabulary, we're comfortable with their vocabulary. When I use churchy vocabulary words, they like it. Um, we all know what the Rose of Sharon is. Oh, that's the... right. Like it, it just <laughs> feels Maranatha. like home. It feels like home. The problem is 100% of your growth comes from the 4%. And just put yourself in, in, in their shoes for a second. I mean, it's a golden rule, like Jesus teaches us to do this. Say you're, you know, Larry from across the street. Um, you come home from a business trip and your wife is gone. You thought you had a good marriage, but now the house is empty and you realize everything that I've believed about the success of my life is falling apart. And all of a sudden, God is speaking to them and they're like, you know what? I'm going to try something crazy. Maybe I can find hope at church. And so I go in my desperation and need for God, I go to the church across the street. And what do I hear? Is a sermon about Calvinism versus Arminianism. And then I realize, yeah, you know what? It was a really stupid idea to come here. Okay, we're not talking to the people who need the gospel the most. We're not sharing the gospel. Most churches don't preach the gospel. Yeah, maybe if you've been there for a couple of years, you'll pick it up a bit, but we're just not focusing on our job on how we reach our community. We're just focusing on our frozen chosen. And that's not good for our people either because quite frankly, they're gonna be living um, kind of a weak and limp Christian life. If you're living a Christian life where I go to a church where people are getting saved all the time, where I can invite my non-Christian friends in, and I know they're going to have a, a fantastic time in their encounter God. That's very exciting for me. And even if I'm an introvert, it's easy for me to invite um, so, somebody, somebody to something I know they're going to love. So if I know that you're a fanatical football fan and I've got two tickets to the game, it's easy for me to invite you because I know you're going to love it. And when our churches are places where I know when you come, you're going to feel welcome, you're going to understand what's going to go on, and you're going to meet Jesus, it's easy and exciting for me to invite you to that. And even to create that culture of people inviting their friends. I'm amazed as I travel to churches all over North America, every weekend I, I minister in a different place, and I walk into a bunch of churches and there's no signs showing where the children's ministry is. There's no sign saying whether the coffee is free or you're supposed to throw a dollar in the, the cup. There, there's no sign showing where the bathrooms are. Like you can wander around the church for a long time just trying to find the bathroom. And I'm like, this isn't friendly for visitors. Like you're not even thinking about visitors coming to the church. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that, that is a major problem. And it's, again, we're focusing on the 96%, we're ignoring the four. Um, and it, it's such a tragedy of opportunity. Um, so here's the math of it. 4% of the people in your church on any given Sunday are first time visitors. Next Sunday, it's a different 4%. And next Sunday, it's a different 4%, different 4%. And when you add that up over 52 weeks, you get up 200%. So you take the average attendance of your church, say it's 100. Over the next 12 months, you're going to have 200 first-time visitors. What would happen to your church if you kept half of them? You know, but we're losing them because we're ignoring them. We're not putting ourselves in their shoes. Yeah, that includes signage. Um, or even to know where to park. You come into the parking lot and where's a visitor supposed to park? Or is absolutely. there even a parking place for them? Absolutely. And when someone comes in, does anybody talk to me? Does anybody engage? Now, a lot of our churches will have greeters, you know, who'll say, hi, welcome. But I've, my local Walmart has greeters who say, hi, welcome when I walk in. And I've been going to Walmart for, I think, 40 years. And in all those years, you know how many Walmart employees have gotten to know my name? Like zero. Do you know how many friends I've ever made at Walmart? Zero. Um, being friendly, whoop de doo <laughs> We can find friendly anywhere. What we can't find anywhere is friends. And so 
we need to actually love and care for those people that God are sending us because they're already coming to our church. They're coming in droves. People that God is calling them. Um, and it's hard for them to get here. Like, we need to understand their journey. I've, I've heard so many stories of people who would tell me that it took them three or four tr attempts to come to our church because they drive in, they were parked in the parking stall, white knuckling the steering wheel um, for 20 minutes before driving away in tears because they were too scared to come in the door. Mm. Okay, we don't know the journey that they're going through. And when they come in and we just ignore them and we're blind to them uh, and we don't care for them, if you come into my church and nobody cares for you, you don't feel loved, I can be on the stage, standing on my head, juggling fire, talking about the love of God, and you will I've not believe me. I've tried that before. I've tried to <laughs> juggle fire. You won't believe me. Yeah. But if you come in here and you feel welcome and you feel loved and you feel part of the family and like you're not getting just like a fake Walmart greeting that, no, I feel included. I've never been in a place like this. I've never met people like here. What is going on here? And then I talk about the love of God. You are going to believe me because you've already experienced it. So walk me through the process as you're coaching a church. What recommendations do you give them for the, for the ushers, for the song service, for the offering time, for the message, for the altar call, for the follow-up process? Kind of walk me through what an ideal process would look like for a visitor. So if a church is at that stage that like, hey, they actually want to reach people because sometimes I have to deal with stuff like we don't care about lost people <laughs> so we have to so that's a that. theological and a heart issue that's right so sometimes you know when I'm going into coach a church that's where we need to do the work but there are this if they're at the stage where no no we want to reach our community what do we do um, the fundamental principle is the golden rule put yourself in somebody else's shoes when I walk in here do I know what to do when the service starts are you speaking in plain English so just talk about like choosing lyrics for your songs um, there's a, a song that's popular in a number of churches um, called Reckless Love. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. But if you look at the lyrics of that song, 95% of that song is going to make sense to anybody in your community. Like there's one line about he leaves the 99. Okay, they're not going to get the reference. But most of that song makes perfect sense. They're going to understand what we're talking about. There's another song that, are, that is popular. Um, Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb who is slain. Who's Judah? Well, he's one of the 12 patriarchs. Why are we singing about him? What's well, a patriarch? Well, because the messianic line goes through the line of Judah. Why are we talking about lions? Oh, that's symbolic. It refers to the Davidic kingdom. Whose kingdom? Okay, you see, so David was one of the descendants of Judah, and the messianic line not only goes through Judah, but also goes through, through David. Now, Lamb was saying, you need to understand the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, how that pre prefigures Christ in Leviticus, and the Lamb was slain, of course, an eschatological figure we see in the book of Revelation. Okay, that's what you need to know for the song to make any sense. Okay, did we have to make the climb that steep? Like half the time when people come in to our churches and they don't encounter Christ, it's not that they rejected what we were saying. They just didn't even understand what we were saying. It was just confusing gobbledygook. Our sermons are no better. And for our churches who actually do attempt to preach the gospel, we're preaching the gospel in Christianese gobbledygook and they just don't understand the words that are coming out of our mouth. So the mm. first thing you want your church to have an impact on people Preach and sing with clarity, not to water things down. And we're not trying to avoid offending people. I mean, we're not going to poke people in the eye, but okay, that's not what we're focusing on is inoffensive sermons. We're focusing on clear sermons that anybody coming in is going to understand what we're saying. Um, so when it comes to the gospel, for example, I understand theologically that repentance and faith kind of a big deal when it comes to accepting Christ. But I also know that the people I'm trying to reach have never heard those words and don't know what they mean. Now, I know um, from studying Hebrew that the word repent, that the Hebrew root is make a U-turn. It's how you give directions, like go down 4th Street and repent. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. I will be on the stage walking one direction saying, I've been going down my own road. I've been the master of my fate, uh, captain of my destiny, living my life the way I want to. Well, that ends here. Jesus is talking about making a U-turn. 
and following him. Even when it's scary, even when I don't understand, I'm putting my whole life in his hands. Everything that I am, my hopes, my dreams, my sorrows, my shame, you know, my anger, my hurts, I'm putting everything I am in his hands and trusting him to make me into someone new as I follow him in a new life and a new direction. So I explained both repentance and faith without necessarily using those words. Okay, that's a skill set we have to develop because I was raised in a church. Christianese is my mother tongue. I speak English as a second language. Um, so are we preaching with clarity? Are we singing with clarity? Um, when you preach, you know, when you, for your own people, when you preach clearly in plain English, guess what? Your people learn in plain English. Because if I preach in gobbledygook, your congregation learns it in gobbledygook. And then when they go out to the workforce, when they go out to the baseball game, when they go out to anything else, the only thing they know is gobbledygook. Why would we be surprised that our people in our congregation are so ineffective at reaching their friends? But if we preach in plain English and explain the gospel in plain English, we're our equipping our people in plain English to reach their friends and neighbors in plain English. So you wanna make the biggest difference in your congregation in being able to reach newcomers and actually seeing your own people be more effective at evangelism and discipleship? Learn how to speak in plain, ordinary English. It's a discipline, it's hard. People don't know what discernment means. You, if you have to use the word, take explain 10 seconds it. to explain it. Uh, don't make a casual reference, hey, just like Joseph, you know. Okay, who's Joseph? Okay, take 10 seconds to explain. Give people on ramps to what you're talking about. And that is probably gonna make the biggest difference. What about the follow-up process for that 4%? How do we close the back door so they don't just come in and leave, but we can retain some of the 4% that are visiting every Sunday? Well, I think the key is going to be developing relationships, so friendship. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, I talk about, you know, we in order to have someone follow Jesus, they need to make, make friends with us. Because if you read your gospels, Jesus discipled the disciples within the context of relationship. Uh, so when someone say they, they raised that hand when I made that gospel call, I've already trained my ushers. They're already at the back. Um, everybody else's head is bowed and eyes are closed, not my ushers. <laughs> They're already at the back and they see who raised their hands. And they've already been trained to come up and approach them after the service, introduce them. Hey, my name's Tom. Da -da -da -da. How you doing? Da -da 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 -da. You know, how long have you been coming here? Da -da. Hey, I would really like to introduce you to my pastor. Is that okay? Now, because I saw their hands, like when my ushers bring somebody to me, I know this is a new believer. Yeah. Uh, well, then I can have a conversation with them. I can give them a new believer's Bible uh, and say, hey, you know what? We've got this small group program called Alpha. It's a free meal. Why don't you come out? It's a fantastic way to, you know, to get started. But we want to get them in relationship as fast as possible. So follow-up is crucial, crucial, crucial. And uh, we want to connect with them as soon as we, we possibly can. We don't want to let that get cold. And again, it comes down to the, the whole love of God experience. If they don't f experience the love of God from us, they're not going to believe in the love of God. Let's talk about the, the Canadian context here. Most of the churches that you're, you're working with here are in Canada. Is there anything unique to a Canada that might be different than say the United States or other countries or are these principles, do they work everywhere? So I've used these principles in, in other countries and like, like Canada and the United States are fairly culturally adjacent. Um, so if you're an American coming to Canada, like the least foreign country you could possibly visit is this one uh, and vice versa. Um, but I've seen this work very effectively in Thailand, which is a completely different culture. And that's because we're talking about some basic human principles. People need to be known. People need to experience love. People need to experience acceptance. And none of us feel that way when we're being ignored. So we want to be certainly culturally sensitive. So if you're going to Thailand 
uh, and you've got a habit of touching people's heads, don't do that in Thailand. That's considered very rude. Um, mind you, seriously, dude, that's weird here too. Uh, <laughs> you know, but you know, sometimes our own we have got. Let's little... bring all the visitors up, and I'm gonna pray for you yeah. right now. <laughs> sometimes in our church. Uh, we develop weird microcultures. Like I remember my, my, my last church, uh, if you were sick, the only way to heal you was to bring you out to the front of the service in front of everybody. We would hit you in the head to try to make you fall over. And that's how healing happens. Is there anything in the Bible that says we have to do it that way? No. And we kind of realized, you know what? That's actually kind of weird. And people coming in here are kind of terrified by what we're doing. Maybe we should find like non-terrifying ways of doing things. Um, so there's ways where we can think about, well, things happen in context. So you look at the Apostle Paul. Uh, Apostle Paul said, I am all things to all people. So by all possible means, some might be saved. To the Greeks, I'm like a Greek. To the Jews, I'm like a Jew. Well, that wasn't just words for Paul. If you look at the book of Acts on how he behaves when Paul's in a Jewish setting, man, he turns into super Jew. Hey, I'm a Pharisee and, you know, I studied in a gamma meal and he's quoting the Old Testament left, right and center. Like, I mean, he he puts it on really thick with the Jewish stuff. But when he's talking to a Gentile audience, he doesn't talk about any of that. In fact, uh, at Mars Hill, he starts quoting their poets and using their cultural references to bring them to Jesus. So he adjusts the way he talks depending on who he's talking to. And I mean, we understand this when it comes to age group. You know, I'm not gonna talk about substitutionary atonement when I'm talking to preschoolers. Okay, so we, we've got some kind of understanding of that. Well, we need to know who we're talking to and then adjust our vocabulary and how we explain and how we act compared to who we're talking to. Well, thank you so much for being on the Evangelism Podcast. If someone has some questions about how their church can be more effective at reaching their community, what's a good way to get in touch with you? What's, what's your email? Uh, they can reach me at just john at albiston.com. My last name is A L B. I-S-T-O-N dot com. Um, and there's some free resources on there. But yeah, anybody can get in touch with me and uh, I'm more than happy to help. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I love what you're doing. I, I love coaching evangelists and people who are excited about reaching the lost. And I think so many churches need to have that heart for their community and, and, and for the lost. And, and not just talk about it, but take tangible steps to make it happen. Absolutely. So, just so much love what you do and so valuable. Well, thanks for having me on here. Thank you. Are you called by God to be an evangelist? Do you want to lead millions of people to Jesus? Do you desire to be trained in the practical side of building a ministry? Then check out the Daniel King School of Evangelism. Learn how to be an effective evangelist from Dr. Daniel King's 20 plus years of experience. Daniel King has done crusades all over the world in over 70 nations and has seen over 2 million people give their lives to Jesus. But it wasn't easy. There was no crusade school. So Daniel traveled the world, learning from and observing top evangelists noticing how they successfully won souls for Christ. Now he wants to share decades of knowledge and experience with you. Topics of the Daniel King School of Evangelism include what is an evangelist, how to be a master soul winner, how to give an altar call, how to organize a crusade, how to raise money for your ministry, and much more. If you want to be an evangelist but don't know where to start, the Daniel King School of Evangelism is for you. Enroll today in the School of Evangelism by going to danielkingministries.com slash evangelism. Thanks so much for listening today. I am excited about telling people about Jesus, and I want to invite you to be a part of helping us to rescue people from hell and take them with us to heaven. There's two things you can do to help. First of all, can you go find the Evangelism Podcast on Apple iTunes and leave us a positive review? By giving a review, you will help other people find these valuable resources about sharing our faith. And second, would you become a financial partner with King Ministries? 
Every single dollar that people give us enables us to lead at least one person to Jesus. And so that means for only one dollar, you can help start a party in heaven. And so today I want to invite you to become a monthly partner. You can start out for just a dollar, but if God puts it on your heart to do more, of course you can do more. But please go to kingministries.com and become a monthly partner with us today to help us to lead lead more people to Jesus. Thank you so much and God bless you. For more information about how to share your faith or to financially support our worldwide evangelistic outreaches, visit kingministries.com. Again, that's kingministries.com.